So my, my presentation today is, is titled Why Butterflies Matter. It's something, a concept I've been working on for a little while. It's probably been about four or five years because I'm, as Gwen Ellen mentioned, I'm deeply interested in butterflies ever since I was a little kid. I used to collect them and get ridiculed by all the, the kids on the street and all over the neighborhood and the school and it just goes on. But, um, but I didn't let that stop me and um, I found, just as a kid, I was very fascinated with the colors and the beauty of them and their, their habits and all the different, um, different things they could do, different habitats they live in. And as I got older and got more into a little more of the technical aspects of things and started studying biology and all kinds of other whatnot issues, um, I found out that butterflies are a bit more important to us than most people realize. And so today I'm going to speak to you for about 45 minutes or so, and hopefully when you leave this room you'll, you'll be a believer that these little bugs are pretty darn important and worth protecting. So that's the one political message I'll leave you with. <laughs> and, um, and after this presentation we'll have a little break. Um, if it turns out we run a little quicker, then I'll start the, the second part, which is about butterfly photography, a little early so we can, can really dive into that material because it gets more technical in that part of the presentation, and you guys may have more questions for that too. So um, let's get started. So you've probably heard in the news maybe a little bit that butterfly populations are declining. Has that been something people have read in the papers, magazines and stuff? It's really only been about the last five to 10 years that this has been observed as a problem. And before that, it, it used to be, we really didn't con concern ourselves much with them. But what's been going on, and just a couple specific examples, is that monarch butterflies, the population of monarchs has declined by about 74% in less than 20 years. And one example of that is that I monitor a web, uh, website by a guy named David James, who's a professor at Washington State University. He's got this big uh, preserve in Vantage, Washington, up by Richland, where they've counted and tagged monarchs for something uh, going on like 12 or 14 years. This is the first year they've had no butterflies come to that preserve. Absolutely zero. So there's a big problem, and it's really a full-on emergency. And um, the Xerxes Society that's do doing some of this research has found that California is really the gating area right now where we need more milkweed habitat set aside because the monarchs overwinter on the coast and when they fly north they have several generations of offspring by the time they get up here to the northwest and to Canada. So um, a lot of people in Oregon are planting milkweed including me but the monarchs are, the chain is getting broken down in California. So that's one of the things, if any of you have property in California or know people that do, urge them to plant milkweed there. It'll really help. Um, in worldwide, there's been, there's about 70 butterfly species that are known to be endangered today. I actually think that number's an underestimate, but I guess I'd say that's those ones that are known. There's actually a lot of butterflies we don't even know about, and new ones are discovered every year. New species are discovered every year, usually in tropical areas, but you might be surprised um, where they turn up. We've also had butterflies suddenly come back from what we thought were extinction, like up in uh, Puget Sound area, there's a butterfly called the, um, it's a marble, I'm trying to remember the last, the first name of it, but anyway, it's, it's a wh small white butterfly that they just found on some islands there that they thought was gone. So once in a while, if you get lucky, you find a few and then you can, then you have the problem about how do I preserve them? And they're working very hard up there right now to try to bring back some of the native plants that that butterfly feeds on. But of course, climate change is rearing its ugly head and as the sea levels rise in Puget Sound, the coastal plants that this butterfly feeds on are unfortunately in a lot of danger. So we've got lots of issues that are, that are contributing from different directions that are impacting butterfly populations, whether it's habitat change, development, climate, all these things, insecticide use, it goes on. And um, I'll hopefully maybe come back in another couple of years and share with you a research paper I'm working on on that topic, but it's not quite ready yet. A little teaser for the future. So anyway, with all these issues with butterfly populations and insects in general all over the world, you might ask, why are butterflies important? You know, they're just bugs. So I wanna try to change your minds about that today. Let's take a look at what butterflies do. They're really elegant organisms and they solve a lot of important problems. And I, I don't know if anybody can think of some of the issues or problems butterflies have solved that maybe we as humans are still working on. Anybody have any ideas out there? 
Pollinating, yeah, that's one of them, yeah. How about flight? <laughs> Efficient flight is, is gonna be coming up in the presentation. But there's even more, so I'll, I'll get to that in just a moment. There's a field of study that's, that's just come on scene, uh, and it's called biomimetics. Anybody heard of that? Biomimetics is a field of, of biology and engineering. It combines those two together, so it's how we can study nature and incorporate things that nature has done into our own inventions. And you've probably heard a lot about things that have been inspired by nature and different, different types of inventions that people are looking at, and we'll see some of that with, with butterflies today. So some of those discoveries are actually already helping your lives, and some of them even come from way back in the 60s and even before that. So here's a few of the things that, that butterflies have contributed to your knowledge or to your lives and, and improved them, and you may not have even known about it. Flight, medicine, material science, design of materials, optics, navigation, telecommunications, agriculture, and renewable energy. All those things have um, improvements either accomplished or in the works that are related to butterflies and their cousins, the moths. Here's a monarch butterfly, a pair of monarch butterflies. And this is a very high magnification close-up of the wing of the monarch. Anybody ever seen butterfly scales up close that cover the wing? A few people. So that's, if you magnify a butterfly's wing, this is probably like a, uh, probably a 25, 30 power magnification. It's covered with these tiny overlapping scales that look like shingles. And they have, they're different colors, and that's where, how the butterfly gets the colors on their wing. And what's interesting is those scales do a lot more than just color. The, the scales on that butterfly's wing improve the aerodynamic efficiency by 38%. And this experiment was done by a, a clever guy in a lab that what he did was he measured the drag on a monarch's wing um, in a little wind tunnel. And then he took the scales off because I don't know if you've ever rubbed the scales on a butterfly's wing and they come off, has that ever happened? So he took the scales off. I think this was a dead specimen when they did it. So they didn't hurt the poor thing. But anyway, then they tested the, the, the butterfly again in the wind tunnel, and they found out that there was much more drag on the wings without the scales there. And so now people are scrambling to figure out, can we make that pattern on a wing of an airplane? Because if we could do that, or on a propeller, we could dramatically increase the efficiency of, of those, those things. So, very interesting, we could reduce fuel consumption, it'd be very, very important to be able to accomplish that. There's another little butterfly that lives around here, mostly in the uh, scrub oak steppes, and some of the, some forests in, in the coast range too, and it's called the little green hair streak. That, that butterfly there is only about that big. It's a gorgeous thing, it's like a little gem when you get it up close in your, in your camera, and I'm gonna show how you photograph that later. Um, but anyway, that little green hair streak's wings don't have any green in them. You know about hummingbirds and their little, their little colorful throat patches they have? And that's called iridescence. That's created by microscopic structures that diffract light like a prism, and they reflect back preferentially a certain color. Well, in butterflies, they use kind of a similar thing, but it's a different structure, and this is called a gyroid. It's a very fancy-looking twisted thing. That There's a little drawing of one down there. And those gyroids actually diffract the light that comes in from the sun or whatever's outside, and they preferentially reflect back just that green light there. And some people got to thinking about that and said, I wonder if they do anything else to the light. And some optics researchers found out this stuff is, is really cool. The gyroids circularly polarize the light. And that's a very special type of manipulation of a light wave. And I'm not going to go into all the detail on it, but if you ever, anybody is, does uses a polarizing filter as a photographer, okay, most uh, cameras that have autofocus these days, you have to buy this special filter that's called a circular polarizer. Anybody who dealt with buying one of those? Maybe not so many, but if you go into a camera shop and you buy a, a filter, they'll usually ask you what kind of camera you have and they'll make sure they hand you the right one because the old linear polarizers don't work with, the, with new SLR cameras. But anyway, that circularly polarized light can be used to manipulate light for laser communications. And you can, by using different polarizations of that light, you can cram more signals down on optical fiber. 
And so this crazy little structure that a butterfly created, the people in the lab actually magnified the wing. This is an actual uh, photo micrograph. Of, I think it's an electron micrograph, actually. It's colored green because you expect it to be green, but um, it's those are electrons that are making that image. So the guys in that lab 3D printed that image in plastic with a special microscopic 3D printer, and they started testing it optically. And now it's being looked at to um, work with these um, laser telecommunications emitters to send signals down fibers, and it's actually working very well. So what they did was they, they made an artificial structure that was much more regular compared to this one, which has other different lines mixed in with it. And uh, the reason they did that was they found that the circular polarization of the gray hair streak was very weak. They couldn't figure out, well, why is it so weak? And they started taking it apart and doing just different parts of that structure. And they found that that was the part that was actually doing most of the polarizing. And so it's, we're still trying to figure out like why the butterfly is doing this. But some one hypothesis people have is that other animals can see circularly polarized light really well. So the, gray hair, the green hair streak may have figured out evolutionarily that I want to make this green and this works, but I also have to mask it so these other predators don't know who I am. And so it's actually canceling that circular polarization. And we now by taking apart and understanding how everything works, we can, we can actually take that part away from it and use the very pure circular polarization of that gyroid structure to help us do internet, believe it or not. <laughs> oh, one other quick thing. In the presentation, I do have a set of references at the end. I'm gonna try not to trip over myself here. And I do have links both here and towards the end of the presentation. So if any of you get curious about some of these things, you wanna know more about them, you can do all kinds of reading later on. And I'll find a way to get those references to you so that you've got them. Because I think some of those papers, the, the original scientific papers are really, really interesting when you go in and you see what these clever scientists did to discover this stuff. And sometimes you read articles in you know, magazines and other publications, they've all been dumbed down for the public and you, you don't learn as much as what you find out when, when you look at the, what the researchers have been doing. Any questions so far? Okay, we'll keep going. You probably know about monarchs and milkweed. That's kind of something that people get taught in school when they're, when they're very young. And that the milkweed is actually poisonous. Did I, anybody not know that? Well, anyway, monarchs take that toxin from the milkweed and they incorporate it into their bodies and then when, that gives them the ability to fend off predators both as a caterpillar and when they, they, they keep that toxin in their blood even when they're adult butterflies. So if a bird tries to eat a monarch, they will spit the thing out because it tastes awful and it's actually pretty toxic. So people have been started starting to think about that and realize, well, hey, if caterpillars do this, if they actually incorporate these toxins from plants into their bodies to keep predators away, maybe those things are really good possibilities for pesticides because some of the predators of butterflies are things like wasps and, um, and birds and other things like that. And if we could make uh, a food distasteful to startlings, that might be pretty good, right? Fruit growers might really like that. And um, people might also be able to, you know, it would be nice to have a wasp repellent that really worked. Instead of those stupid little yellow traps you hang in your backyard that all the wasps do is they fly around and sting everybody else and never go in the trap. You know, so there's a lot of people looking at, at these chemical incorporations and um, there's a whole bunch, I could give you a whole bunch of examples because butterflies this is one of the things they do really, really well is there's tons of different species that have specific food plants and specific toxins they're using from those plants for certain purposes. And we are just scratching the surface on that. There's hundreds or maybe even thousands of different chemical combinations that butterflies are manipulating for their own health and benefit. And you know about butter butterflies' antenna? There was little tiny skinny things. This is a greatly magnified picture of an antenna. They're about the width of a human hair. There's a hair there. And antenna have been a mystery for a long time for um, butterfly researchers. 
but they're really starting to uncover what they're doing now. And antenna not only sense chemicals like smells, and they help butterflies taste and look for plants that are healthy or stay away from plants that are not healthy for them, but recently they've discovered that antenna actually can do optical sensing. And so both in monarchs and in some other butterflies that migrate, it turns out that there's sensors in the antenna that are sensitive to the blue light in the sky. And those sensors are, are delicate enough and accurate enough that they actually can create a clock in that antenna that's very accurate. And so butterflies can use the signal from the blue light in the sky with their antenna to create a clock that synchronizes their brain for navigation. So that's kind of a complicated drawing over there, but it is, I've got the reference for the paper for you to look at later if you wanna understand more. But it turns out in, in these butterflies, there's two separate mechanisms going on. Actually, there's more than two. But there's clocks in the antenna that respond to that blue light. And they synchronize with another set of clocks that are, that are triggered through the eye. And in, then the combination of the eye readings and the antenna readings lets them understand where they are in terms of longitude and latitude. It's really crazy. So what this is, has a lot of implications for is not only just understanding how butterflies can migrate and maybe we can help them if they have trouble migrating, but we may also be able to develop some interesting navigation systems that don't require electronics, sensitive electronics to work. They might work if we have, you know, you've probably heard of the, the dreaded EMP that when in these doomsday war scenarios that might disable GPS or there's a solar storm or something like that. Well, we may be able to come up with some robust navigation mechanisms that don't require those sensitive electronics to work or don't require satellites orbiting around the Earth to work. Monarchs don't use satellites. What do you need those stinking things for, you know? So they've solved this problem in their own way and it works, it works great. And here's another cool one. The texture of the surface of a moth's eye is being studied and they're trying to create anti-reflective, actually I shouldn't, shouldn't say try, they've actually demonstrated these things in the lab and they do work. They've created anti-reflective display coatings. They're also scratch resistant and self-cleaning. <laughs> so you can do everything. And it's just because of what this, this special texture that's on a moth's eye. So there's a particular moth that's over there. Here's the electron micrograph of the, of the texture the looking straight on at the eye, so that's as if you were just staring at the moth, and this is a cross-section of the moth's eye with the structure just on the very surface of it. And so those tiny little globes or dots or circles that they have in there, by selecting the size of them appropriately for the wavelength they're trying to, trying to allow to transmit, they can make anti-reflective display coatings that are far more transparent than anything we've created. So your typical iPhone display screen I'm gonna look for that. This thing is about 5% reflectivity, the, the best that they can do right now, okay? The, the moth re anti-reflectivity is 0.23%. So it's like a tenth or less of the reflectivity of one of these screens. So if you could coat this, and they've actually shown, they've actually done some of this. If I coated that, this screen with that material, there would be no reflections you'd see off it when I'm waving it at you like that. It just would look black. And that's, that's from a moth. So I don't know, have, I, have you guys ever looked up close at the head of a moth before? You've gotten, one of these days, if you catch a moth, hold them up, just grab them, hold them very gently in your hand and take a look at that little head on that moth. And you'll find that many moths, especially the ones that fly at night, have these really black eyes. And so some curious scientists tried to figure out why are those eyes so black? And that's, that's what led them down this, this interesting, interesting rabbit hole. When you magnify this thing, here's the eye. And there's a tiny, tiny piece of that eye. And they're kind of these hexagonal rods that are packed together. This is called a compound eye. Compound eyes were originally thought to be very primitive and simple. And they're discovering now, no, 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 they're not that simple and they're not that primitive. 
they're actually very, very clever. So that compound I is covered with this kind of granular texture here, so they magnify that again. I guess it goes over here. That's 200 microns there. You blow that up to 20 microns, and you can see this, this pattern is repeating again. But at the 20 micron scale, and you go down to the one micron scale, and there's actually little tiny dots even on that. So it's kind of like a fractal pattern. It repeats at many different dimensions. And that fractal pattern has been duplicated now. Here, they've gone and made another kind of 3D printed version of that. And NASA is using that in a, in a uh, space probe. And they're using it to um, measure light um, in space probes that are way out in space where, you know, like the New Horizons spacecraft that went to Pluto. Remember all those beautiful pictures of Pluto that you saw? Well, Pluto is really far away from the sun. It's dark out at Pluto. It ain't anything like the sunlight that we get. So when you're, in, when you're out there in that environment, you need a very, very efficient photo sensor for your camera. That's what is taking the pictures. So those moths are actually helping us develop these incredibly efficient photo sensors so that we can see in the dark. So can you think of any, now I probably let out the answer, but can you think of why the, this coating would be very useful on a moth? So they can see in the dark, right? Yeah. Moths, most moths, not all, but most moths fly at night. And so in order for them to see well in the dark, they need to have the minimal amount of light reflecting off of the surface of their eye. And so they figured this problem out. And that's one of the reasons that moths are so good at flying at night. You guys starting to realize these are pretty smart creatures? So not all butterfly wings are covered with scales. Remember I talked about the monarch where you strip the scales off. Well, there's a special butterfly that's called a clear wing. There is a clear wing right there. And clear wings are um, usually in tropical countries. We have a couple of, of moths and butterflies in the US that have some clear spots on their wings, but the ones in, in Latin America and South America, almost the whole wing is clear in some of them. And there's a researcher that works at Caltech that, <clears throat> excuse me, I think his wife actually um, had a real interest in butterflies. And she asked the first question, this Caltech researcher works in an optics lab, and she said, you know, I, I think they went to a butterfly garden or something like that, and she saw these clear wings, and she was really in on them, and looked really close, and she said, you know, there's something about those butterflies. Their wings are really clear, like, like too clear. There's something that's keeping, the, that's keeping the light from reflecting off them, and they're using that for camouflage or something, but they've got a trick. And her husband got more interested in that, and he started doing some studying, and he found out, yep, she's right. So kind of similar to the moth pattern, the clear wing butterfly has a similar kind of pattern of dots on the wing. It's a little different arrangement, but it achieves a very similar thing. It makes the wing very transparent. It doesn't reflect much light at all. And so this guy figured out, his lab was actually trying to design a implanted sensor that goes underneath your cornea for people with glaucoma. So anybody in here have glaucoma? A few people, right? Okay. You may get one of these sensors because what they do is it can, they put this thing underneath, there's a whole video that you can take a look at, there's a link to the video there. They put that sensor, it's a very tiny disc that's almost invisible and they slide it underneath your cornea and it measures the, the pressure in your eye very accurately. And they have a little, a little electronic gizmo that you hold up with, a, it has an electromagnetic field that communicates with the device. So you just, when you want to take a reading of your eye pressure, you just hold this thing up and click a button and go beep. And it tells you what the pressure in your eye is. And that tells you if you need to take a medication or put some eye drops in or something like that. You could even modify this a little further, which I think they're working on right now, so it's more real time. It'll actually give you a warning because you could have this device just weared around your neck or something like that, and if you know, it, if it detects the pressure is too high, it'll let you know by vibrating or something that you need to take, take action now and keep it under control. So a very, very clever little uh, device that this guy's invented, inspired by a butterfly's wing. Anybody had cancer? I'm a survivor. 
If you've had lung cancer, there's a chemotherapy drug called Olympta you may have heard of, may have, may have even taken. And the core of that molecule is something called Terran. This is the, this is the Terran base down here. And that Terran molecule is in the butterfly wings of the brimstone butterfly, that yellow, yellow guy right there. So the people that developed um, Olympta actually used that, that molecule as a basis for their, um, their drug. And they, they did some testing and research on you know, screening various kinds of compounds. And they found out that there was some anti-cancer activity there. So there's at least one chemotherapy drug that's been, uh, you can thank a butterfly for. Anybody seen blue morpho butterflies? If you've been to the tropics or even seen them in collections and stuff, they're just the most gorgeous things. This is one from my collection that I've got. And um, again, people starting to think curiously about butterflies. Well, these things live in rainforest. It rains a lot. How do they stay dry? Well, they actually have a similar trick that the monarchs have. The wing scales, the texture of the wing scales on a blue morpho's wings repel water. So there's all kinds of things you could do if you can have a water repellent coating. You can do things like maybe make special paints that don't require as much cleaning. You can um, make aircraft wing surfaces that don't ice up or they, they repel the rain very easily. So you can reduce the pollution from de-icing fluid and you can have aircraft that are safer because they are less prone to get icing. So there's all kinds of great things that um, are being looked at right now from look, studying the blue morphos wings and how they repel water. And the monarchs aren't, aren't finished yet. <laughs> Not only do they have the clock mechanism for their navigation and for their migration that they do from Mexico or California all the way up to the northern US and Canada, but there's also a magnetic protein that they've discovered that may act as a biocompass. So that's a whole chemical diagram of the, of the protein. But there are these iron loops that are inside of the protein that are magnetic. And so this is in the, in the monarch's brain, and we still don't understand how they combine the two and what they, why they need both the sensing of the blue light and the compass. But if you've studied the problem about, there's all in, in recorded history, the, the big breakthrough in navigation was how you determined your longitude. Because longitude requires a clock. And so monarchs probably use a combination of a clock and a compass just the way we do when we're navigating. So the mechanism is still not quite figured out, but we have an example in, in human history where we're seeing this, this thing has been, is being played out in, in the insect world as well, that they had the same problem and they had a similar way of solving it. So what happened next was once they figured out about this protein, some guys, I think they were from China, Created, recreated the protein in a lab, and it aligns with the rotating magnetic field just like if you have the same strength as the Earth's field. This is in, a, in some sort of a flask or test cell, and they found that it will rotate just with a, a small magnetic field that's similar to what we have all around us. So I've got a video in here I can show. I'm going to see if I can make it work. And there may be some noise. Don't get startled because it's really a loud noise if it does come through the speaker. So we'll see what happens. You can see it rotating there. Pretty crazy. It'll be done in just a second. And there is a link to that video, although you probably don't need to watch it over and over again. But <laughs> <laughs> once is enough to, to see that those butterflies are pretty clever. There's another butterfly called the European Meadow Brown. They are all over Europe. They're in England and, and on the continent too. We have a, a similar relative here called a wood nymph. I don't know if you've ever, ever seen wood nymph butterflies, but they look a little like that. And this European Meadow Brown has an odd looking uh, bunch of compounds in, in its body that are called open furan ring lolines. That kind of my chemical engineer things coming out at you, so. But 
they, these are really interesting, interesting molecules, and it turns out they have antibacterial activity. And they're being looked at now for a new class of antibiotics because of the antibiotic resistant superbugs that we're getting a little bit concerned about. So what, you know, bacteria have been around a long, long time, and there's lots of, of organisms out there that are fighting bacteria and have been doing it since the dawn of time, a lot longer than we've been trying to do it. And so we still have a lot of, of things out there we can learn from other, other uh, creatures around us, and, and these little butterflies are one of them. Orange tip butterflies live around here. I don't know if any of you ever seen these. They come out in the spring. They're usually out like February, March, April. They're a beautiful butterfly. They're only about that big. But when you see them flying around, I always loved it because it meant spring was here. They were some of the first butterflies you see. So I think orange tips are great. Um, there's also another interesting thing about orange tips I might tell you in a little while. Now these, if you think about butterflies and how they operate, they lay their eggs on a food plant, the caterpillar hatches, eats some of that plant, sometimes eats too much of that plant. But anyway, they'll do that, then they'll turn into a chrysalis, and then they'll hatch out into an adult. Well, if you have a bunch of butterflies swarming around and they all laid their eggs on the same plant, that would be bad for the survival of that butterfly because they'd exhaust that food plant supply. So guess what? They've got a system that they use. They have a dibs system. They lay their eggs on a plant, and they leave a pheromone with it. And that pheromone lets the other butterflies know, hey, I got this plant. It's taken. Go somewhere else. So that's how they, they divvy up the plants so that their food plant is, is distributed among their population, and they get to survive better. So you can realize that and think, hey, wait a minute. If I had some of this magic dibs chemical and I sprayed a field with it, that would tell all the butterflies to stay away. So now orange tips aren't a pest, but we can now start looking at other insect pests and find out if they have a similar mechanism. And if they do, we might be able to come up with some very safe insecticides that are not poisonous, but they do a great job at keeping the bugs away from our crops. So this is being looked at really enthusiastically right now. Anybody ever dealt with RH disease in your family line? You don't really have to worry too much about it anymore because it's very treatable in, in terms of a pregnancy because there's a vaccine that can be used. Well, the guy who created that vaccine is Dr. Cyril Clark. And he had a hobby of raising butterflies and also plants, I think, too. He had this giant greenhouse in his, in his home. And... Um, he discovered that he started crossing two butterfly species. One is called the Old World Swallowtail, which is this one here, and the Black Swallowtail. And he found out that when he crossed those two butterflies together, certain offspring would, be, would have the black coloration while certain wouldn't. And they had a certain pattern of inheritance that looked just like RH disease and the way it was inherited in humans. And most of this came out before there was knowledge about DNA and all this other stuff and, and the genome. So it was very new at that point. But he discovered through butterflies that there was an inheritance pattern with RH disease, and that led him to be able to understand how to identify people who were at risk and also to develop the vaccine for it. So there's a whole book you can get to read, read about that, and it's right over there. And um, I have a, a reference to the paper also at the end. So it's a fascinating story. This is one of the first situations where we learned from butterflies something that made a huge impact on human lives, because I think this dates from like the 1950s or 60s when this happened. So it's a pretty cool history, and it's really, really inspiring. So butterflies are pretty, pretty interesting in a lot of different ways. They're, they're very generous providers and teachers, and we, we probably don't give them enough credit for that. As someone mentioned in the beginning, they do pollination for us. Now, I will share with you that butterflies are not the greatest pollinators in the world. They're OK. Bees are a lot better. So I urge you to keep working on, on preserving bees and protecting bees and, and helping eliminate some of the threats to, to bee habitat. Uh, because that's, that's really where we get most of our pollination services from in agriculture and just for nature in general. But butterflies do play a role. They're, they're, they're definitely uh, useful for pollination. Butterflies are part of the food chain. They do feed a lot of critters around us. 
Um, if you have a cat, you probably have a cat come home once in a while with a butterfly. But they feed a lot of other, other creatures too, especially birds. Not all butterflies are distasteful to birds, and so there's, there's quite a few that birds do eat. And as you probably discovered a little bit today that you may not have been aware of before, they're, they're very important model organisms that teach us a lot about um, adaptation, evolution, mimicry, all these different things, because the one thing butterflies are really good at is breeding. And they breed very quickly, they, they reproduce very quickly, and so they have, on an evolutionary scale, they are much quicker than a primate evolutionary scale would be. So what's cool is that a researcher can study butterflies in a lab and they can have multiple generations very quickly and learn a lot about what might be going on in evolution far quicker than they'd ever learn with a lot of other organisms. And it turns out there's a, I don't think I have the reference right here, but there is a recent paper that just came out, it might have come out after I wrote this presentation actually, that the butterfly genome is actually, of all the insect genomes that have been studied so far, the butterfly genome is the most rapidly changing one. So these butterflies are really moving along on the evolutionary scale, and so we can, we can learn a huge amount from them. Um, another thing I heard about recently was that, um, you remember the disaster in Japan um, from the earthquake over there, the Fukushima accident that with that, with that power plant? Well, they found that some of the butterflies that live around that power plant have been experiencing radiation damage, and some populations of those butterflies are, are under threat, and they're declining in that area. I don't think they're in danger of extinction because I think they're pretty widespread, but they've noticed that around the Fukushima plant, there's certain butterflies that are absent. But they're also finding that some butterflies are, are becoming more, um, more prevalent that are able to adapt to the radiation stress. So there's a whole bunch of activity going on right now around that nuclear waste site or nuclear accident site to understand what's happening in the butterfly community because they are evolving so quickly. We can learn a lot about how radiation affects our health and what might be done to, to help prevent it. So that's a, another very, you can just Google that. I think you can Google Fukushima and uh, butterfly radiation effects and you'll, you'll get that paper pretty quickly. They do, they are very profound indicators of ecosystem health. The butterfly diversity in an area, and I'll share that a little bit more. I've got some maps I'll show you in the um, photo photography presentation that the diversity of butterflies in a given region says a lot about the health of the ecosystem. And that's a research topic I'm working on on this paper that I'm, I'm dealing with. Um, and one thing I will say is that in Oregon, we are experiencing a lot of diversity decline, but we're also seeing some interesting stuff where because of climate change, species from places like California are starting to migrate to Oregon. And we're actually seeing a few species from California arriving here that haven't been observed in a long time. So we're getting a, a little bit of, of migration as California warms, Oregon is starting to look a little bit better to some of those butterflies, and we're acting like a little bit of a refuge for them. That's not the case so much for the monarchs because of the issues I, I shared with you before, but there's a couple other butterflies where, where that is happening. And butterflies do have a little bit of a, an interesting um, right brain effect. They're sources of beauty and inspiration, aesthetic value. There's been literature, great literature written about butterflies. You may know a little bit about Vladimir Nabokov, famous author. He wrote a lot about butterflies. Um, there's a lot of great stuff in our culture about butterflies. And so they have a, a nice value that we have to respect for that too and realize that, that we, can, we can get a lot of, of benefit besides some of these nerdy things I've been sharing with you. This butterfly here is called the dead leaf butterfly. It's, um, it lives in Asia, in India it's very common, but other, it's a pretty widespread butterfly in India and, and all over Asia. And when you look at that thing, it, it looks exactly like a dead leaf. It's even got a stem. And it's got a vein that runs up the leaf, run, and it's got veins going the other way. So that's a beautiful example of camouflage that's evolved camouflage in a butterfly. And when that thing lands on a tree and touches its little stem to that tree, you can't tell that it's there. If it opens the wings, the wings are beautiful inside. It's got orange and blue and black and a little bit of yellow, I think, in there too. And so when the wings are open, it's pretty obvious you've got a butterfly there. But close them up, and, and you have this beautiful... Um, camouflage job. So that's just, this research I've been doing, like I said, for about well, 
maybe about five years to pull all this stuff together. But that's just the beginning. There's a whole bunch of other things that are coming down the pike that we're going to be seeing from biomimetics. We're going to be seeing things like self-assembly. If you think about a butterfly and how it, it's, those scales on the wings, how do those color patterns get put there? There's got to be a whole chemical system that lets that butterfly make a pattern while it's in that chrysalis to design that pattern. It's all governed by chemistry. If we can figure out how to make that work, we could create things that build themselves. We could have different materials go to different places. And we're, you know, we're trying to build semiconductors right now through some really kind of Stone Age um, methods like lithography, where you have to expose things and use all kinds of harsh chemicals. Maybe we could actually come up with ways that work like butterflies do, or we could arrange things microscopically with, with just some very benign chemistry. So there's some, a lot of people in the semiconductor industry are really starting to look at this stuff. Um, as I mentioned, there's these medical applications. So there's things about chemistry, drugs, agricultural chemicals, pesticides. There's all kinds of ways we might be able to learn from butterflies and moths to um, create solutions that need chemicals, but do it in a much safer way with much less environmental impact. And there's also things like efficient flight that we talked about, miniature sensors. The idea that you have this thing that's the width of a human hair that can make a clock, that's pretty darn good. You know, look at the, the watches we wear, even though we, you know, the watches, are, these, the watches are pretty darn big and the timekeeping mechanisms certainly shrunk over time, but imagine what we could have done if we had the, the butterfly antennas, the first thing we figured out to make a clock. We might have been a lot further along. So these are all the references. I'm not gonna bother you with them, but we've reached that, the end of the first part of the presentation. I don't know how we're doing for time here. Doing about right. So um, I'll take some questions, and we will see if we can get to the photography part. Yeah. My name is Hans. I'm trying to attract wild bees by uh, common garden flowers, and I've noticed that the modern hybrids are not as uh, inviting to them. What about the uh, milkweed? for a butterfly attraction. Do we go back to the original? Yeah, so is, is milkweed a good butterfly nectar plant? Is what there you're are saying? so many varieties of milkweed now. Yes, um, milkweed is a great butterfly plant. And um, even though we don't have monarchs right now in our region very much, I have milkweed growing in my yard and I get all kinds of the, the swallowtails, the big black and yellow butterflies, love milkweed. And so when I see painted ladies on milkweed in my neighborhood, I don't have a lot of different butterfly species in my neighborhood, but I do know that it's a great uh, nectar plant for butterflies. So even the modern hybrids of milkweed are attractive? Uh, yeah, they are. If you're using the milkweeds, get, it's an interesting topic because there are different kinds you can buy. Some of them from the southern U.S. especially are not native to our region. And so the thing I would recommend is if you're going to buy a hybrid milkweed, um, take a look and make sure it's not an invasive plant in our region. Um, the one that's called the showy milkweed is a native plant that grows here. There's another one that's called butterfly weed that's got an orange flower, and that's very easy to find in garden centers. And that one, even though it's not native, it's also not considered an invasive. It's a very safe plant to plant in your yard. I have some of it. It's a beautiful garden plant, and it won't get out of control and spread. But there's another milkweed that's called tropical milkweed, which is, has a, a flower that's red and orange, I think, if I remember right. And that one's a little bit more, um, a little more risky to plant in our region because it has a fungus in it that apparently monarchs can catch that can kill them. So it's not a good plant. I wouldn't recommend planting the tropical milkweed here. Um, even, in the, even in the southern parts of the US, it's being discouraged because now they've discovered that this fungus is in that plant. So that's the one I would stay away from, but both the butterfly weed, which is the scientific name for that, Asclepius tuberosa. You can find that one, that's a very nice plant to plant, and the Asclepius speciosa, which is the, the uh, showy milkweed that lives native to here, is fine to plant it. If you drive down to Eugene, it's growing along I-5 in the, in the ditches along I-5, which ODOT regularly mows right when the caterpillars are turning into chrysalises. If there's anybody in here who works for ODOT, please tell them to stop. I've written letters to them and we've, we've tried and it, it's just, it's very difficult to get them to change what they're doing. But um, 
anyway, it's, uh, I would highly recommend the, the native milkweeds and just make sure, just do a quick check and make sure it's not invasive. Stay away from the tropical milkweed. Other questions? Um, Paul the, here. The microphone, I have to follow yeah. the microphone. Okay. Yeah. Um, because the butterflies evolve quickly or can't have the ability to, where are moths and butterflies in terms of on the evolutionary time scale? Are they relatively recent uh, um, type of uh, life form that's come on, or are they tra track back uh, a long, long ways? They're, they, I guess I would put them more a little bit relatively recent, yeah. I'd have to go look up the number to tell you how many millions of years they've been around. Um, but there's been, there's been, a, there's a lot more insect lineage behind the moths and the butterflies that have been here longer. Um, there's some moths and butterflies that have been preserved in amber. So at least we know that as, as long as there's been amber, there's probably been moths and butterflies. Uh, but we don't know too much more about, about it than that. And that's an area of research I think is very, very, um, could be very, very fruitful because if I look, when I look in the literature, I don't see much about it. And so I do think there, there's, there's some of it's still unknown about how far back they really do go. So I can't fully answer it, but I can, I can tell you that I do know from, from what I've seen so far that I think they're in, in, in the insect world, they're relatively recent as far as how they've evolved. You had mentioned that uh, some butterflies, are, many butterflies are dying off and others are, seem to be more resilient and adaptable even to nuclear contamination. Has any research been done to determine why some butterflies seem more resilient than others? That is a really good question. And I, there is some, and I haven't really looked into it too much. So that, and you've given me something to go back and, and do a little more looking into. Um, I know with, in the case of Fukushima, there is a paper that, that has been done about those blues and how that they have, um, they've had radiation damage that's affected them. And I don't know how, how much depth and detail they've discovered on if they have an actual cause or they've narrowed it down to certain genes or whatever, but I do know that, it, that that's probably the most recent information I have. I can give you some specific examples of butterflies that are known to be very adaptable, and I think there's been a little bit of work done on it, but I think there could be a lot more. And anybody know about the cabbage white, or also some people call it the cabbage moth? It's actually, it's a butterfly, it's not a moth, but everybody calls them cabbage moths. And they're a white butterfly that if you go outside, you'd see them, you know, they're probably at the end of the year now, you're not seeing too many, but cabbage whites are very ubiquitous, they're worldwide, everywhere you go you see cabbage whites. They are probably the most cosmopolitan butterfly that has evolved insecticide resistance and all kinds of other predator resistance, and they are just incredible at how survival, survival, survivable they are against all the stresses we've thrown at them. And um, I do think there's been a little bit of work done on that, and I need to go check out those papers and, and learn a little bit more, because I, I think there's some good stuff there. Um, butterflies, the thing that, that makes butterflies typically have problems with survivability is their food plants can be very specific to the butterfly species. And so most butterflies that if you look at that have gone extinct or are in danger of extinction usually have just one food plant or maybe one or two or three that they require and guess what? Those plants are ones that we've destroyed because we've done some sort of development or we thought they were weeds or you know, that's what's happened with milkweed is farmers killed milkweed by the, you know, by the acre with Roundup and other insecticides like that to keep it off their farms and now we're finding it's not such a good idea to do that. So um, that's because monarchs are one of those butterflies that does have a specific, um, in this case, sp specific genus that they require, which is milkweed, but they can eat just about any kind of milkweed. It's okay, but um, guess what? Almost any kind of milkweed is considered a weed by a farmer. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's a problem. It's Barbara over here. The the yellow butterfly that was that was um, used for cancer. Brimstone. Yeah. Is that a, is that a sulfur? It's it is a sulfur. It, it lives in Europe. It's a, in okay. England. But not all sulfurs do that. Then. Uh, that. No, not all okay. sulfurs have that that uh, particular chemical in their wings. But the brimstone does. Yeah. But there could be a lot of other chemicals in butterfly wings that do things we don't know about yet. That's just one of the first examples. Yeah. Okay, I'm amazed at what these butterflies have going on, but I'm equally amazed at how the scientists figure out what's going on. For example, the one that discovered a cancer medication. What's the process they use to 
pick out of a hat these possibilities? What happens there is called drug discovery, and you can Google that term. And so what, what happens is, in, in when, people, when researchers are looking for drug candidates, they will screen a bunch of chemicals. So what they'll do is they'll go and get a whole bunch of different insects and grind them up, separate them out, of course, you don't want to put them all together, but what they'll do is they'll have different, they'll put them in different bins and they'll say, let's, let's test these against tumors or against a particular kind of disease. And if they find something, then they'll go and divide, usually what's do, done with the, what's called a binary search. So you might have like 30 bugs in a sample. And if that, that sample has activity, then they'll take half the bugs out and see if which bin the sample is in. And then they're, if after 15, they say it's over here, they'll go th cut that in half, they're down to seven and then three, and then one. So that's how they do drug discovery, and that's been done with, with soil bacteria and funguses. Um, a little off topic, but if you ever heard of Rapimune, it's an antibiotic that's also used for stents in your heart. It comes from a soil fungus from Rapa Nui, which is Easter Island. And so you can look that guy up, and that's a drug that some people took a bunch of soil samples from all over the world, and they found out that it, they could get an antibiotic activity from, from that soil. So it's trial and error, is, but it's smart trial and error, because they're doing this by, by having the ca chemicals in each sample until they, they finally narrow in on the one that they, they have that, that does the job. So, and that's called drug discovery. You can read all about it. More questions? One more, okay. Could you please explain why you need a clock to determine longitude? Ooh, now I have to think about that because I'm not a really good navigator. <laughs> you, need to, you need a clock to determine longitude because the Earth's rotating. So if you, if you think about it, I can determine latitude by looking at the angle of the sun and the time of year, right? So I know from looking at, and also the stars, by the way, I can look at the stars at night and I can tell what latitude I'm at because once I have a map of the stars in the sky, I can compare that and say, you know, Orion's really low at this time of the year, I must be at this latitude. So latitude's actually pretty easy to get. If you have a sextant, you can, you can any, if there's anybody in the room who's a boater that does navigation, talk to him. <laughs> he will tell you if you have a sextant and a, and a chart, an astro astronomical chart, you can figure out your latitude. It's easy. But to figure your longitude, you need a clock because with the Earth going around, everything in the sky is moving all the time. And the distance above the horizon is not the same as the, it's, it's easier to measure that than it is to measure the distance going side to side because the Earth is turning. And so in order to determine where you are, you need to know, you need a clock to tell you, I need to measure this star at this time in order to know where I am. So it's, be, it's that second part that's the tough part. I can measure the star, but I have to measure it at the correct time to get a longitude out of it. Now butterflies do it a different way. They don't look at stars, they look at the, the blue in the sky. So what they're doing, and I could I give you a little experiment that you could try, okay? Because when you look at the blue, it turns out human eyes are really lousy to detectors of blue light. It's actually the worst wavelength we can see. When you think of ultraviolet, right? Ultraviolet, you can't even see ultraviolet, so we're really poor with blue. But if you can get one of these polarizing filters, do you think you can get your hands on one? <laughs> or get a pair of polarizing sunglasses, okay? When you do that, do this for me on a clear day, Go look up at the sky, hold your glasses up. You can turn them until you get the sky to be as dark as possible. And then rotate around. And what you will see is that the blue that gets through the glasses changes. It gets brighter or dimmer depending on where you are once you've turned the polarizer to screen out most of the light. And you'll, you'll be amazed, because like when I was a photographer, I first figured this out, this out, it was like, oh my God, you know. I never noticed that the light in the sky is polarized that way. But when you do that, that simple exercise of turning, blocking the light and then turning your body, you will see that there's a huge variation in the polarization of the light, the blue light from the sky. And we can't see it with our eyes, but the butterfly antenna can see it. And so that's, and I, I think there's also some, a tricky thing that the butterfly antenna are arranged in a V, right? 
So they have two angles they can check simultaneously. So that's the other thing is they probably know from where, how much blue light is reaching antenna A versus antenna B, the right or the left antenna, they can tell which direction they're pointed just by knowing that, that difference in the blue light. Pretty clever. But that's the way you can demonstrate is go get yourself a polarizing filter. I ha this is Gwen Allen. I have a couple of first grader questions. One is why are they called butterflies? And why, um, why with their sophisticated dark, I mean their vision in the dark, then their radar, whatever, um, why are they attracted to the light? Ooh, boy, okay. Those are really good. Um, butterf from what I remember, butterflies, is, it's actually not really known at all why we call them butterflies. If you look up the origin, the linguistic origins of the word, there's a couple of references in literature about butter and that there were insects that would be attracted to it. And so I don't, I can't tell you that that's really the reason that, and where, whether or not those insects were butterflies is not really well understood. There's no drawings showing a butterfly on a stick of butter from you know the 1700s. So I can't point you to that, but there is there is some evidence in the in, in you know the older literature, older poetry and texts and stuff like that, where butterflies was a construction that came about, and then somehow it got associated with with these creatures. And it could be something like the fact that these brimstone butterflies are yellow, that the color is similar to the color of butter, and maybe that was part of it. But again, it's not an easy question to answer because I don't think we really know. Um, and as far as what the second question again, tell me. Was them the, being attracted to light. Being attracted to light, so okay. They have the sophisticated mechanisms for the dark. Yeah, and that's typically a moth thing. It's less of a butterfly thing. You don't, if you put a light outside, butterflies, at, at night, butterflies are all asleep. They don't fly at night. Um, but why moths are attracted to light, it's, that's, a, that's something that I need to also take a look at and see if I can get you an answer on that. There's some, there's some evidence from what I recall that the moon is used by moths as an orientation for courtship. And so what it is, is what, one of the reasons moths are attracted to light, and I can't say this is the only reason, but when the moon is out, the, the moths use that as a way to find each other. So they have specific directions and places they will fly, which are different for different species, but they use that moon as a, as a beacon that, that helps them find each other. And with butterflies, there are also kind of interesting behaviors that butterflies have that are analogous. They're not the same, but uh, I'm gonna, I was gonna talk a little bit about that in the second part, about some of the butterfly behaviors that are similar, so I'm not gonna go into that quite yet. But they do have, if you look at the two, the two uh, orders of, of insects, they have different mechanisms that still accomplish the same thing. And that with moths, the, the light at night from the moon is thought to be one of the reasons. And that is probably the main reason why they're attracted to light, is the moon. And unfortunately, some of our, thi our creations, like artificial lighting at night, can sometimes they can help because they might provide a way for the moths to find each other, but they also might hurt because the moths can die or be dis distracted. And we understand so little about it that right now we're not really very good at figuring out what those impacts are. But that's something where there is some research being done about it, I know, so. Well, it should be a big night tomorrow because the hunter moon is. Yes, the hunter moon's so coming out, yeah. Watch for moths. We'll take a break now, about a 10 minute break. Thank okay. you so much. Okay, here we go. So one gentleman came up and asked this question about, or, or let me know about, um, this radiation thing about, we, we both had the, the story about the, butter, the blue butterflies that are over in Japan from the Fukushima incident. Well, the Chernobyl accident that happened, there's all, there was also um, research that came out that there's a particular form of butterflies or moths that's called a gynandromorph. And what that means in Latin is a, is a female male form. So what it is, is a, a butterfly that's kind of, or moth that's split down the middle and has one part, one sex on one side of it and the other sex on the other side of it. And so there, we don't know if there are transgender or gay butterflies, <laughs> but we do know that there's gender binary or gender non-binary butterflies. So that is, in the, in the butterfly world, it is, it does, that kind of a concept does exist. And um, these, Gynandromorphs, this isn't really a good website to show you them. This is BBC Earth. 
If you Google Chernobyl and gynandromorph, which is that word right there, you will find this article. But there's actually some, here's a moth up there where you can see the two colors. It's a little hard to see on this display, but one side is kind of brown, the other side's yellow. And here's some blue butterflies that are exhibit gynandromorphy or gynandromorphism. The blue part of the blue is the male. Male blues are, have blue color. Female blues tend to have browns. So those are split down the middle and you can see there's blue on one side, brown on the other. And um, so that apparently is caused sometimes by radiation. Maybe some of these gynandromorphs just simply had a cosmic ray pass through the caterpillar's body or something at one time and that radiation impact could have caused it. I don't know if any of you have ever been to the Exploratorium in San Francisco. Did you ever see the cloud chamber that was in that? I don't know if it's still there, but when I was a kid, I, I lived in the Bay Area, and they had, I think at that time, it was the world's largest cloud chamber. So the thing was about, I don't know, it was about six feet across, and it was this big glass table. It was about a foot thick, and inside there's air with that saturated water in the air. So what they did was they supercooled the air. With, it was a steam, basically a steam bath that was supercooled. And so the inside of that chamber, there were no nucleation sites at all. It was just totally polished and smooth. Just like if you ever boiled a pot of water on the stove and you didn't, you took the lid off, you just cleaned the pot and the water was ready to boil and, but you looked totally calm and you dropped something in by accident and almost exploded all over the stove. Well, that's how a cloud chamber works, is that they have a super saturated water vapor in there. And if a, a, a particle, an atomic particle or cosmic ray passes through that, it'll ionize the air in the chamber and all of a sudden the vapor will come out of, of the air and condense in there. And you'd stand in front of that table and you'd just see all these cosmic rays just going through this chamber. And it was kind of weird thinking, that's happening in your body. So, you know, that's how, that's one of the ways people get cancer and other various kinds of beneficial or not so beneficial mutations happen. So if you ever get to the Exploratorium, see if they still got the cloud chamber. Okay, back to photography. Are we doing okay for time, by the way? I'm not really keeping too much track of it, so I wanna make sure we're okay. All right, here we go. That's a uh, anis swallowtail and it's perched on a lupin up at the Tom McCall Preserve up in um, the Columbia Gorge over by Mosier. Anis swallowtails are pretty common. They're actually all over the state of Oregon. So I, have you ever seen that species of butterfly? Few people have, yeah. They're, they're pretty easy to find. But that was a very special one and I'll explain a little bit about that in a few minutes. But you can tell it was a very cooperative subject and that was, I probably got 30 photos of that butterfly. That was one of the best. So here's what we're gonna talk about for photography today. Um, first, I'm gonna talk about a little bit before we get into the pictures themselves about how you, um, let's make sure this is, is the mic working? I'm sure it's good for the guys in the back. Okay, we're gonna talk about how you find the butterflies, some um, field watching tips, because if you wanna take pictures, you gotta have the butterflies there in front of that lens, and that is surprisingly more effort than you might think. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about data sources, how you can actually do, use the internet and some other things to help you improve your luck and, and maybe develop a little more skill about how to find butterflies so you don't waste a lot of time on it, which I have probably the master of wasting time on butterflies. And then uh, photographic techniques, so that's where it will get a little nerdy and we'll see based on how the audience is coping with that whether we wanna spend more or less time on that. But it's actually, if you're an engineer like me, it's actually pretty cool. There's a lot of neat stuff to learn about how you take a good butterfly picture. And we'll talk a little bit about adding creativity to your, your photos as well, because not, uh, not everything is, is all about, about being a nerd. Sometimes there's some art in this too. Okay, so if, if you're gonna do butterfly photography, well, you need butterflies, right? So how do you get them? In the field, one of the things to look for is, is plant diversity, wildflower diversity. So anytime you have a meadow that's full of different kinds of flowers, that's where you're gonna find butterflies. You're not gonna find them, yeah, I shouldn't say you won't, but they're not as prevalent in a place that has one or two species of flowers. 
unless they happen to be a really attractive one, like milkweed is a really attractive flower for butterflies, and you'll see a bunch of them in a field of milkweed. But your average field of dandelions is not really that great a place to find butterflies. But if you can go someplace that has, has you know, 30 species of flowers, that's a good place. You want sunny, calm, warm weather. Butterflies are kind of solar powered. They're cold blooded and they need to warm up. And so on a nice sunny warm day, they're gonna be active. And if it's really windy, butterflies tend to, tend to hide. They like to be out when there's not too much wind because they don't wanna get blown around. And um, look for moisture sources. So typically anywhere, a riparian area is better. You know, any place that's a wetland near a river bank, sometimes ditches by the side of the road are good because there's water that accumulates there. And one of the best places to drive around is a forest service road and go up and look. Anytime you're on a forest service road where there's lots of flowers in the ditches along the road, get out and look around and you'll probably see butterflies there. Um, the middle of the day is the best for activity. Butterflies, because they are cold blooded, they're not up early in the morning and they go to bed pretty early in the evening too. So. There's some ways that can be helpful. I'll talk to you about that. But if you just want to, want to maximize your chances of seeing butterflies, you need to be out around in the middle of the day. And if you're in town, towns are not the best places for butterflies because we've done some really bad things. We use a lot of insecticides, and we also get rid of all the native vegetation, and we replace it with stuff that is you know, garden variety things that most of them don't live in the area, and the native butter, butterfly species don't eat those plants. And so it's a little hard to do, but if you, if you are able to do it, you can create habitat in your own yard. And you can do that by planting more native plants and avoiding the use of insecticides. And there's some good references out there. Um, the Xerxes uh, website and my website, which is lensjoy.com, has some information of butterfly food plants. There's also a couple of publications you can get that are free. Um, there's one about, I think it's called native plants for the Willamette Valley or water, no, it's water efficient plants for the Willamette Valley. And most of the water bureaus have this book and it's also online on a PDF file and you can download it for free if you don't want to buy the book. Some places will give you the book but you should ask first because it's, it's either seven or fifteen dollars if you get charged for it or free if you're lucky enough to get it from a water bureau that's got a budget. So I highly recommend that book it, or that uh, publication. It's full of good gardening ideas. So when you're going out to look for the butterflies, here's a bunch of things to think about. Wear a hat and some good sunglasses, and that way you'll have less glare because you've got to be able to watch for them. They, they move really quick. A lot of them are camouflaged, and so they can be surprisingly tough to find and to track. And so the, you have to improve your vision as much as you possibly can. That even means go and get an updated eyeglass prescription if yours is a little out of date. I've done that before too, and I've noticed, hey, I can't, I'm not seeing as well as I used to. I better get into the optometrist. When you're around butterflies, step very quietly and don't talk. They can hear very well, and they can feel vibrations through the ground very well. So you wanna be, be very careful with your steps and, and don't be chatting. Don't have, the, don't have the headphones in your head playing music either. That won't work. And don't cast a shadow across the butterfly. They're very sensitive to that. Once in a while, you might get lucky enough to find one that doesn't mind your shadow intruding on it, but as a general rule, try to make sure if you're trying to close in on a butterfly to get a good close-up picture, don't have an angle of your camera or where you are going to be putting that butterfly in the shade. It's not good for the exposure, and it's also not good because it's going to startle the butterfly. Um, that same kind of thing applies to approaching them. They can see better ahead of them than from behind. So it's better to approach them from behind rather than trying to walk up the front of them where they can see you. And if they see you coming, they're probably thinking, oh my God, get out of here. If you are far enough away from the butterfly and you want to make sure you get some sort of record of it, then be sure to take a picture even if it's not a great one. Because more often than not, um, especially the first time you might come on one, and especially if it's a rare species, it seems like if it's rare, you'll try to approach a little bit closer and it'll be gone and you never get a shot. I had that happen to me last, um, in, in August, I found a butterfly from California called the California Sister. It was in my backyard and I was out, I was making breakfast and I saw it sitting on some rocks in the backyard and I said, oh gee, that's a California Sister, it, doesn't, it never lives here. And I went and grabbed my camera, I went out, and I wanted to get a little bit closer, and it disappeared. <laughs> so I never got a picture of it. So it happens even to me. 
don't use fragrances or repellent because butterflies can sense chemicals really well. That even kind of boils down to using sunscreen. I mean, sunscreen is good to protect you, but it's probably better when you're going out to shoot butterflies if you just wear long clothing and stay away from the sunscreen. If you've got a hat and a long sleeve shirt and long pants, you don't need the sunscreen. Some of the behavior I was alluding to a little bit before about some of the interesting behavior moths have around the moon and stuff like that. Um, butterflies have, a, have courtship behavior that's called patrolling and hilltopping. And what patrolling is, is that typically the males will fly along an area and make a loop. So like if this little area down here in front of me off the stage is like a trail, there might be butterflies that might go travel along that, that clearing in the woods where a trail might be or some sort of path, and they'll go to the end, and they'll, they may fly up in the trees and go back, but then the same butterfly will, another five or 10 minutes, will come and do the same thing. And if you see that behavior going, that's great, because then you know I can just stay here and wait. I don't have to chase after the butterfly, and if I want to take a picture, it'll come back. So if you're in an area where patrolling is happening, you don't have to be chasing the guys, just let them come to you. Hilltopping is another type of behavior that butterflies have for courtship. It's kind of like when you go into a bar, right? Where do you meet people? You meet people in a bar, right? Now, maybe not the best place to meet people, but it works for just meeting people. We're not talking quality here. We're talking quantity, right? <laughs> so what butterflies do is they know that if they fly to a top of a hill, there'll be other butterflies there. And I don't know, have any, any of you noticed that? Have you ever noticed when you're sitting on top of a hill at lunch with your picnic, there's butterflies around you? That's hilltopping, okay? So that's where you want to go to take your pictures. If you happen to be out in the woods and you know a nice little open hilltop with some flowers on it, go there because that's where you're going to find the butterflies. And then once you've gotten a few good shots for the day, you can go do some exploring and maybe find some other places where there may be your odds aren't as good, but you might see some more interesting species. But if, you just, if your goal is to get out and take some shots, go to a top of a hill with flowers. You'll see them. You always will. Okay, another thing that, is, that I've learned over the years is that if you have a, a butterfly that's a little shy, if you re a, approach it repeatedly and do it carefully, they'll get more used to you. And I've had that happen many, many times, and it's been written about by other photographers too. So you can get them used to your presence. So you just have to kind of get a little close to them, take your shot or try to take your shot, and if they come back again or just move a little bit, then. Uh, carefully approach them, try again, and you might finally get to the point where, yeah, now it, it's not panicking by having me here, and now I can really get the photo I want. So don't worry if they do fly off. If it doesn't look like you've totally freaked them out and they've completely left the area, you might be able to approach them again and again and get them used to, used to enough to your presence that you can really zoom in and get that really beautiful close-up shot. Try to wear drab clothing. The more you blend in, the better. Butterflies can see color really well, and sometimes the colors really, really can get them to be uncomfortable. So um, I know that with, with bumblebees, it can be the opposite. Bumblebees love blue, and if you're wearing blue, people have probably had that experience where you wear blue and you have bumblebees land on you because they think you're a flower. But with butterflies, usually I have the opposite problem. I'm wearing bright colors and they disappear, so. I've got a, a web page up on my website that talks a little bit more about other tips for butterfly watching, but those are the, the highlights there. I'll give you a link to that later with the um, QR code so you can just take a picture with your phone. Some places where you can go. So if you're from the Salem area, you can go into the Sayusla National Forest and most of the uh, forest roads up there, if you get into not that really dense wood, but or dense woods, you need more open sunshine, but along a wider road with good ditches and with flowers, you'll probably find butterfly activity along those places. Um, the upper parts of Highway 224 and the Clackamas River drainage, that's closer for you guys than going all the way up to Portland or all the way up to Mount Hood. There's some pretty good roadside um, flower blooms in those areas. Mary's Peak's a little closer to here. That's a nice place to go. Mary's Peak is where you can see the uh, Taylor's Checker Spot, which is an endangered uh, butterfly that, that there's ongoing work by the Nature Conservancy and I think the Oregon Zoo, too, to protect that, that particular butterfly. And so you can, you can walk around up there and just photograph them. There's no restrictions on that. Iron Mountain, you've probably heard about. Very famous wildflower area. That's a good place to see butterflies. That's because there's lots of different wildflower species there. That's what it's known for. 
You might also find a lot of people there when you go to Iron Mountain, but you know, that's okay. That's part of the part of the attraction. Anywhere along the Cascade Crest is is pretty good because you have changes in elevation. And another thing that butterflies like is changes in elevation. That's because of the hilltopping behavior, and it's also because elevation gradients produce plant diversity gradients. And so you know how you, when you're driving through the Cascades, the, the vegetation just changes dramatically when you go over the top. You go from the, the rainforest side on the west over to the eastern high desert, and it's boom. It's like none of those plants that are here were over there. And that, that diversity change is a great, um, great breeder of butterfly species. You'll see lots of them along the Cascade Crest. And this map here is one I put together of butterfly species counts per county. And who would have thunk it that Klamath County is the best? But they're the winner when it comes to um, butterfly diversity. Guess what else is down there? Cascade Siskiyou National Monument. That's one of those places they want to shrink. It's not a good idea for butterflies. We want to keep that monument as big as we can get because that's, that's the best place in Oregon for butterfly species. Jackson County right next to it, has got Cascade Siskiyou, I think is partly in there too, but those are the hot spots in, in Oregon. There's 130, 140 butterfly species in those counties alone. What's up in Salem? Yeah, you got like 80, you know. Where I live, Washington County, I've got 60. And it, I know, I, I really do know, I don't live in a good spot for butterflies. <laughs> and Portland is, you know, Portland is just about as bad. And we go out to the coast range and it's, it's not very good either. And that's true, Oregon and Washington coast both because it's very wet, very cool, there's not a lot of sunshine, and it's mostly forest. And butterflies want open areas for the most part. And they want warmth. And you don't get that on the coast. So the map makes a lot of sense when you start to think about it. You get out to Eastern Oregon, and once again, you get out to Baker County, Willowa County, more butterflies, because there's elevation gradient there, lots of different plants, and so you got lots of different butterflies. Also, not much development, not much agriculture, not much insecticides. So that's another, another way you can tell um, where you're gonna find those, the different species of butterflies. Here's some of the data sources you can use to spin yourself up and, and get up to speed on where to find butterflies. You don't have to do this all yourself. A lot of it's already been done for you. Just gotta know where to look. There's a great field guide that this is called Butterflies of the Pacific Northwest. Anybody meet Bob Pyle? Very, actually a very famous author. He's been on Oregon Public Broadcasting about some book about Sasquatch, if I remember right. He wrote that, he wrote that Sasquatch book. And he's got a new book that he just came out that I'm trying to remember, I don't, I'm not gonna remember the title, but it's something about, he grew up I think in Colorado, and it's about some stories in Colorado that he, when he was growing up, and it's supposed to be a very good book. He's a real luminary for the Northwest region for butterflies. Um, and Caitlin Labar, it was his partner for this book, and it, I think it came out in March this year, um, so you can easily pick it up right now. It's a fantastic book. If you want to do anything with butterflies, you need to have this book. It's great. It's got excellent, high-quality pictures. The previous edition to this was a good book, but it didn't have really great pictures. And um, that was because it was done before the digital age. Now they have just all kinds of very high-quality photos in it. I'm kind of a little bummed they didn't ask me for any of my pictures, but they didn't know. They, they were on a, well, totally unaware of me at the time, so. If you want to go online, there's a, a website called butterfliesandmoths.org. That's the one I recommend because technically it's a rigorous website. When you go into that website, you can create your own account. You can log your own observations. They walk you through the process. And your observations get curated by real lepidopterists with degrees. And so you can't enter bad data because they won't let it happen. And then once your data is in their database, you can go pull up a map and say, hey, I want to go look for the species. And the map will come up and say, here's where the, all the places they found it. So you can get from that all kinds of great intelligence about where I should go drive, what I should go see, what time of the year to go, because the dates are all recorded for everything. And with butterflies, it's all about time and place and habitat. And so you don't want to do this on all random. You want to go with a little bit of advanced research that you've done if you're trying to find something specific. 
There's another one called iNaturalist, which is more of a generalized website. It's about all kinds of different species. It's not just butterflies. It's got birds and all kinds of critters in there. Um, that's a little bit more generalized website, but I find it's not as tuned to the needs of butterfly watchers as, as butterflies and moths is. So I'm not saying don't use it. If you're a birder, you might want to use iNaturalist because you can put both your butterflies and your bird observations in there or other stuff. eButterfly is another website. I don't view it as being quite as good because it doesn't have the level of scientific rigor that the butterflies and moths website has, but it's got lots of observers. And it's another data source that's out there that's got pretty similar functionality. So take a look at it. I think eButterfly is a better app for your phone. I don't think, um, I don't think butterfliesandmoths.org runs outside of your phone's web browser right now. So, but I think eButterfly does. LepSnap is a mobile phone app that you can take a picture of a butterfly and it will attempt to, mo to identify it for you, which is pretty cool. And it's usually pretty good. I've had pretty good luck with it. And you can share your observations there, and, but it's more like a social media type environment. It's not so much of a scientific environment. So if you're more into just, hey, I want to go out and take pictures and share them with friends, then LepSnap might be the, the tool to use for you. There's a, another organization called the Biota of North America Program, bonap.org, and they have plant diversity maps. So you can use the Bonap maps as a way of kind of cluing you in on where I might go to, if there's an area in my state that has a lot of more plants than others, or if you're traveling, you wanna go, maybe you're gonna go someplace elsewhere in, in the country, or actually North America, I think they all do all of North America. So you can go look, if I am even go up to Canada, I could maybe identify a place where there's a lot of plant diversity and make, put that on my itinerary for the trip and have a good chance at doing some butterfly watching um, using their data. So I, I do heartily recommend to join some of these websites and contribute your own observations because that's how the scientific community learns. We can't do it all ourselves. It's very expensive to go out and spend hours and hours in the field driving around and burning fuel trying to find butterflies when there's people running around who might be able to do that and help you. And that's really the new trend in what's happening with um, butterfly data these days is the use of big data in these big databases where the data is just sitting there waiting for somebody to come up with a use for it. And so the more people we have dumping data in from their observations, the more we're likely to, to fund research from that that can be very easy to do once the data is there and require very little upfront money to accomplish. I can sit in front of my computer now and I can do experiments from my living room that would have taken me years to do if I had to do, get the data myself. And I can do them in, in minutes for basically no money. And so that's what these sites are really good for. If you've got the time, please help. Do some old fashioned note taking. Just take a little notebook with you and write down when you go to a place what kind of butterflies and plants you saw, what the conditions were like, if you saw any odd or interesting behavior. Take because once you get those pictures in your computer, you'd be surprised how quickly you forget the details. I do that all the time. I, st I have pictures where I said, when did I do that and where was that? I don't remember. So keep a little notebook and just even a few notes will help. Make sure you, um, if you're using geotagging, and you know what geotagging is? Geotagging is when you have the GPS coordinates stored in your picture Usually the camera app will do that for you and some cameras will do that if they have a GPS chip in the camera. So you can turn that on and it's really helpful because it, when you took a picture it will have the location, the exact location stored in there. But if you do that, be mindful and responsible about how you share that online. There's an ethic that I've been a proponent of called leave no virtual trace and what that means, it's kind of like based on the same leave no trace ethic for hikers and campers, but it's the idea that when you're online, don't show people sensitive sites or sensitive species that might cause large numbers to go to that spot and damage it. And we've seen that, there's a lot of news lately about the damage that Facebook and Instagram have done to some of our cherished recreation sites in the, in the US. It used to be years ago, everybody was worried that we weren't gonna have any people using the wilderness. Nowadays, because of social media, we have people mobbing some places and destroying them. And so you want to be careful when you post 
pictures online of butterflies, especially if they're rare or the, the habitat is very sensitive or rare, rare plants are there, don't tell the world about it. Take the geotagging information out. There's apps you can get that are free for your cell phone. There's one's called Coridoco, and Coridoco will let you, with a click of the button, remove the GPS coordinates from the picture. So that way you can still share it, but nobody will know where you took it unless you tell them. Um, if you share your pictures with some of these curated websites like butterfliesandmoths.org, they actually have systems in place that screen the GPS data out so the public won't see it, only researchers, researchers will see it if it's a sensitive, uh, sensitive species. So that's another, another option for you to do that. Some of the other things to write down when you're doing your notes, um, well, I think I've gone through all that. Date and time, behavior, abundance, told you all that. So off we go. This is a sample map you would get if you looked up Edith's checker spot on butterfliesandmoths.org. And so all these circles, there's either the light colored circles are a historical record. Those are, can be very, very old, sometimes way back in the early 1900s or before. And the, the darker circles are records that individuals have contributed. So you can pull up a map like that, you can zoom in, you can find out, you can look at an individual observation from a particular person and see right away where that butterfly was located and what time of the year, and then you could mark that as a place to go check out if you're trying to find that specimen for yourself. And you can see over there, they give you a little life history. They'll, it's full of information. They'll explain what the food plants are, when they hatch out, when you can best see the butterfly, all that stuff is located on that website. So let's get into some pictures. How many people in here have digital single lens reflex DSLR cameras? Maybe about half. How many people use point and shoot cameras? A little bit smaller, but yeah, okay, like the Canon and Nikon, Panasonic, those cameras. How many people just use cell phones? <laughs> okay. There's a little bit for each of you in here. The cell phones, I'll tell you right away, aren't as good, but there's a couple things they do okay. And it's better than nothing. But when we're doing butterfly photography, these are kind of the, the goals, your priorities in order of importance. Is the first thing is depth of field. Depth of field is the depth in the image that is in focus. So you've probably all taken pictures that are out of focus, right? <laughs> Come on, admit it, right? Okay, with butterflies, it doesn't work very well to do that. You, the butterfly's wings, whatever part of the butterfly you want to have really sharp has to be sharp. And there's a lot of things to understand about how to make depth of field work. So I'm hoping that by the time you're done today, you'll understand a little bit more about that and how to take some better pictures. And that will even translate over into your portraits and other pictures that you take once you understand a little bit more about the mechanics of depth of field. It's all laws of physics. So once you understand the laws of physics, it's really easy for the most part. A fast shutter speed is probably your second most important thing for butterflies because they move. And not only do butterflies move, but the people move, right? You were moving, our hands are shaking when we're trying to take a picture of the butterfly. And there's wind, and the flower of the butterfly is on is moving, right? You, you probably tried a little bit of this and been frustrated. So you need a fast shutter speed. Getting it can be a little difficult. Shutter speed is a tough one for butterflies because there's a lot of factors that prevent you from having a quick shutter speed. And you've got to learn what you can set on your camera and sometimes when to just say, this isn't going to work, I'm going to walk away. <laughs> not going to waste my time with it. Resolution is number three. It's really not as important. The resolution of a butterfly picture, it's really nice to have this deliciously detailed picture where you can see all the little scales and everything, but it's really good, better to have an in-focus picture that's maybe not so detailed than it is to have one that's super detailed, but most of it's out of focus. So I think there's a saying from Ansel Adams about that, but I probably can't quite quote it for you right now. But there's something about having a fuzzy picture of a clear concept or something like that. Maybe you remember that one, but it's kind of true for butterflies too. Exposure latitude is another one. It's again, maybe less important, but it, has, it does have some importance, especially when you're trying to take a picture for fine art like what I do. And exposure latitude is the, is the successful rendition of detail through bright and dark parts of the image. So sometimes you'll take a picture of something and you notice you know how the bright parts of it are just washed out, they just look, look white, but there's no detail in it. Or sometimes that's true for the shadows. The shadows just look plain black and there's no detail in that. 
This little butterfly here is a Mormon metal mark, and guess what? It's got dark and light colors on the same wing. And so getting that exposed right is a bit of a challenge. So the better chances, you, you will have better chances at getting a successful picture when you're using a camera with a wide exposure latitude, and that boils down to typically a big sensor. So that means your more expensive, bigger digital SLR cameras are better at exposure latitude. Your iPhone is lousy with it. And unfortunately, the point-and-shoot cameras, they're somewhere in the middle. They're a little better, but they're, they're still not as good as a, as a full-frame 35-millimeter sensor will get you. And then the, the last one is image stabilization. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later, but I'll put it down as the last one in the list because it's not as critical as you might think. It's a real desirable feature. Everybody wants it, but I'll explain a little later that it doesn't buy you a whole lot. So a little bit more about the, the laws of physics here is that talking about depth of field, the larger the sensor in the camera, it's better for exposure latitude, but you're going to find out butterfly photography is all about trade-offs. That bigger sensor has a worse depth of field because the resolution is so high that there's a couple optical laws that say the bigger the area you're trying to expose with the lens, the shallower the depth of field is for a given a given lens. And that's just optics. You can't get away from it. So one of the things that cell phones are good at is they have a little tiny sensor. And so when you take pictures with your cell phone, you, you probably notice that almost everything in your cell phone is in focus. And that's because they have a tiny sensor. So that's one case where if you're not really good at focusing, your cell phone is probably your, your best hope for butterfly photography. So don't, don't discount it completely. The other thing about um, the, more, the larger cameras, the DSLR cameras, and even the point-and-shoot or the mirrorless cameras, which are kind of a newer phenomenon now that's coming along with photography. Anybody in here have mirrorless cameras? Outside of, I guess the point-and-shoots are all mirrorless, but there's also a new class that's kind of a bigger camera that looks a little bit like a DSLR. Sony has them. Canon, just, Canon and Nikon are both coming out with some new ones. I think the Nikon Z series is mirrorless. But the autofocus performance is the thing that is really going to get you a good shot in those cameras. And so if you have a decision to make about a camera to buy, buy the one with the best autofocus system, the one that's the fastest and the most accurate, because that is going to get you the most number of good photos that you're going to not, you won't be as frustrated with that camera. And as I mentioned, the DSLRs are going to give you the best image quality overall. The mirrorless cameras are probably going to come in second. They need to have a good macro capability, though. Your macro capability is very important for those cameras. You want a good macro lens or a zoom lens on that camera that is built into it that has a good macro capability. Use the cell phones when you, you, know, you either don't have your other camera with you or you need quick, something quick to focus on and you don't want to worry about focusing, focusing and use that small sensor to its best advantage. If you can manually set your camera's features, that's better. So if you can choose the aperture, you get better depth of field with a small aperture. So I'll talk a lot more about that in a little while. The other thing that may not be so obvious is that flash is very helpful with butterfly photography. Most of my butterfly photos are taken with flash. The reason, flash gives you more light. And when you have more light, you can close the aperture down more. So you get more depth of field. So flash is the key to getting you depth of field in a lot of cases. Now, if you don't have a flash, you can also boost your camera's ISO, which the, everybody know what ISO is? Fewer people. ISO is, think of ISO as the sensitivity of the sensor. So cameras have an ISO setting. It's like the film speed in the good old days of film. So when you had fast film, it had a real f big ISO number, like 800 ISO, right? You can set your camera for 800 ISO. Some of them have a pretty good picture at 800. Some of them have lousy, noisy pictures at 800. So you have to know what range your sensor will, will work with. But within that range, if you know you get good quality photos at, say, ISO 400 or ISO 800, you can set that ISO at a higher number, and you'll get better depth of field because you can stop the aperture down more and let less light in and compensate it that way, compensate for it by making the sensor work harder. That was a lot harder when I, when I used to shoot film. I couldn't do that. 
and I can get a lot more um, great pictures now with that ISO setting on my camera. So here's the basic way to set your camera up when you're going out to do some butterfly shots. So set it for what's called aperture priority. That's where you control the aperture and the camera figures out everything else to make you use that aperture okay. And if you can use flash, your camera, and this is generally the more sophisticated cameras like the higher end Nikons and, and Canons, and the Panasonic and Sony have this too. Um, you, they will usually have a manual override exposure for flash. And what that means is that you can set both the aperture and the shutter speed to good values for butterflies, and it'll just add enough flash to make the picture work. And if you do that, that's, that's the best way to shoot with flash, is put it in the manual mode. If you find that when you put it in manual mode, you don't get in, you just get bad pictures, you, then it probably doesn't have the right kind of manual override, and then you're, you just go back to regular aperture priority. But if you have one of the better cameras, you'll, you'll put it in manual and just dial in F29 and a 200th of a second, and it's like, wow, it's a great picture of a butterfly. And that's, then you know you have the right kind of camera to do that. <clears throat> Try to use a fixed ISO setting. Don't put it in the auto ISO setting. A lot of cameras will have a setting where you can, it will also try to manipulate the ISO depending on what the exposure is. The problem with that is that if the ISO is going all over the map depending on what picture you're taking, you may have, you may end up with some pictures that are really grainy and noisy because it's trying to use too high an ISO setting. It's not paying attention to the quality of the image, it's just trying to get you a shot. So I recommend until you really learn how your camera works to use that ISO setting. I got five minutes? Okay, we're not gonna get done in five minutes. <laughs> so, let me keep going. Can we run over? No. We cannot. Oh, okay. Well then let me zip through here. You guys are going to end up getting the slides anyway through another mechanism. So I'm going to zip through here a little bit. I've already told you about the small apertures. So I'm not going to deal with that. I'm going to give you a little bit of quick little tutorial. What you want to do to learn to take pictures of butterflies is instead of running around, make yourself a little tiny fabric butterfly. Glue, some, glue a, a piece of fabric onto a piece of cardboard, put it in a pin and stick it in a piece of cardboard, and that's your test butterfly. Work on that. And when you learn how to get that all in focus, and learn how to use your camera properly, then when you go out in the field, you're gonna have like far, far better success. So do that first. I just had that set up in my kitchen. Put your autofocus point two thirds of the way out from the center of the butterfly. Notice the butterfly is folded in a V because that's what real butterflies do. That's gonna teach you how to focus. And then I made this big elaborate Photoshop project where I took different apertures and looked at the detail in the center, in the middle, and the edge, and then I selected the right aperture for me. It turned out to be f29, okay? It's gonna be different for your camera, probably. But once you've done that exercise, you can figure that out, and then once you know what the right aperture is for your camera, then you're gonna be able to get out in the field, set it, and forget it for the rest of the day. So here's an example picture. There's the settings I used. So I had a 105 millimeter lens. It had image stabilization. I used a 320th of a second at f29, and I had ISO 320. And I had a flash there at midday sun. And what, by using that ISO, I got to brighten the background in the picture because I let the camera boost the background intensity. That flash is gonna wash out the background. I shouldn't say wash out, make the background very dark. So if I boost the ISO, I get more of the light from nature coming in. I need less flash. And so I got a really gorgeous picture with a beautiful background in there and that butterfly and it was all properly exposed. I told you a little bit about shutter speed. I'm gonna show you, I won't go into that right now. I'll show you instead. When you are trying to take a picture of the macro lens, the closer you are to the object, the less the depth of field is there. It's very razor thin up close. So if you find that your butterflies have just a small amount of the wings in focus, you're too close to the butterfly. We all want that bright, beautiful picture where it fills up the frame. Sometimes it's better to back up a little bit and get it all in focus.
when you're using flash, sometimes the butterfly freaks out like this one did, <laughs> and it opened up. So you'll have to determine if that's the case, you may not be able to use flash for that shot, okay? There are also some features you can try disabling with your flash. There's something called monitor pre-flash, which is a little bit like red eye where the flash will blink a little bit before the exposure happens. And the butterflies will see that and they'll say, I'm not taking this around, I'm getting out of here. If you can turn that off, turn it off, and you might be able to fix the problem. This is ghosting. You can maybe, this is a little hard to see on this display, but there's a little bit of a ghost you can see right here in the shadow of the antenna. And that's where the butterfly moved during the exposure. So that shutter speed was 1 60th of a second. That was too long. I needed to probably bump the shutter speed up to at least to a 3 20th in order to get rid of that problem. Image stabilization won't work with that because the butterfly is moving. It's not you. I looked at the background of that picture and the flower is perfectly still. It's the butterfly that was moving. They can move very quick. And so that's just telling you, if you're seeing ghosting in your images, your shutter speed's too long. Exposure is also important. You want to look at the histogram of your camera if it has this feature. And if you see the, the levels piling up on the right side or on the left side, then that means you've got what's called clipping. And that means there's no detail in the, in the shadows or the highlights. And so what you should do when you're going out in the field is at least the first few shots, look at those histograms and adjust your exposure until they're right so that you know you're not going home with a bunch of wasted shots. When you're focusing, you want to keep the back of your camera parallel to the butterfly's wings. So if you imagine a, a plane, a big piece of cardboard taped to the back of your camera, and the butterfly is in front of you, you want those two to line up, both horizontally and vertically. And so this butterfly had its wings open and my camera was right there lined up and it's perfectly in focus from all edges of the butterfly, even the antenna. That's a hard picture to do, I'll tell you. But when you get, get practiced at it, you'll be able to. And I mentioned about putting your autofocus point about two-thirds out from the body. That's the best place to get the best depth of field over the entire butterfly. If you try to focus on the center of the butterfly, the wing tips will be fuzzy. And if you try to focus on the wingtips, the body will be fuzzy. So that's the best spot. And that's because of a law of physics again. When you're choosing a, a macro lens for your camera, you want a macro lens that is not too, it's kind of like Goldilocks, not too short and not too long. If you get one that's too long, the depth of field is going to be reduced. You get to be further away from the butterfly, but the, they're so sharp that the depth of field is very narrow. If you use a really short lens, your flash won't be able to reach the butterfly because flashes are really made to, to reach a, mostly for portraits of people in front of you. So you want a lens where you can usually be able to tilt the flash head down a little bit. That flash that I show you on that picture, you probably can just barely tell the head is tilted slightly down. That has a macro setting feature and that's, that's tilted down and that's as far as it goes. So if you have a really short macro lens, like a 30 or 40 millimeter lens, a lot of times you're so close to the butterfly, the flash is pointed way over there. So the 105 millimeter lens, which is this one here, is one of the best choices because it's about the right length that the flash can, can illuminate the butterfly. So pretty much talked to you about that. Couple quick tips for getting your butterflies to pose. At the end of the day, they like to go to sleep. When they're asleep, they're very still. You can often get a tripod picture with a butterfly and stay with it for 10 minutes. That's how that first picture of that swallowtail was done. Also when butterflies first hatch out of the chrysalis, that's called the eclosing. And that is another time when they're very tame and they're, not, they're trying to inflate their wings and they're not gonna be able to fly because they're not ready to fly yet. If you can get a butterfly that's just hatched out, you might be able to have that butterfly for an hour to work with. Do lots of practice, because even if a butterfly isn't perfect, if it's at least cooperative, and there's, but it may be a little beat up or fuzzy, you can still spend a lot of time learning how to take a good picture. Here's a, a photo where we, there's a beautiful bright background, and that bright background was accomplished by using a longer shutter speed, but the butterfly was asleep, so I didn't have to worry about it moving. And there wasn't any wind that afternoon, so I could, I could use a very small amount of flash to lighten the butterfly, get it perfectly exposed, and still have the beautiful glow of a hill behind it. And those shots are, are really precious. They're just amazing. 
for creativity, try to get interesting behavior. Here's some mating green hair streaks. A lot of times mating butterflies are hard to find, but they don't fly around much once they're connected together like that. <laughs> Try to do some in-flight photos. It can be really frustrating, but if you get that one great shot, it'll be amazing to have a butterfly flying through the air. Try to use a continuous shutter where it's rapid fire and get as many photos as you can in a short period of time. Cell phones are good for video because the focus is so good you don't have to worry about focusing the video. So that's another place where a lot of modern cell phones can take pretty respectable video of butterflies. Also look at uh, maybe group shots and, and experiment with composition. Here's a two, two fritillaries together. That turned out to be a really gorgeous photo. That's one of my favorites. And here's one of a swallowtail getting nectar out of a columbine. That's the tongue there. That tongue is going way back up into the top of that spur. It's, it's, the nectar is way at the end of that thing. And if you have a cell phone and you snap that QR code there, that'll take you to the Oregon Field Guide page. If not, you can Google it too. And then there's a whole bunch of references here. I won't bore you with that. There's the water efficient plants for the Willamette Valley there. And I think we're done. Does anybody want to do questions if there's time? Only one minute? Then a quick question, if you've got it. Are we going to do the mic or just shout? <laughs> just shout. <laughs> All right. I had a daughter who was able to have butterflies rest on her hand. I have that, I have that on pictures a number of times, yeah. from when she was very small to when she was older. Now I have a grandson who has a girlfriend who has the same ability. Is this a matter of pheromones? <laughs> it could be. It's like the question there was that he had some relatives that had butterflies rest on their hands and they're very comfortable on them. Could that be pheromones or something else? It could be pheromones. What it probably is, the more I think about it, it's probably minerals. They probably have sweat that has a lot of salt in it. And butterflies like salt because they can't really get salts very much from nectar and flowers. Nectar is a surprisingly low sodium fluid. And so you'll find butterflies getting salt from the creek seeps by the you know, sand by the side of a creek or even manure, believe it or not. They'll land on that and get salt off it. Or urine, urine's another one. So it could be that it's just they happen to have sweat that's a little more, has more richer mineral content and the butterflies like that. Well, I feel like, kind of like the Far Side cartoon where the kid is wa <laughs> raising his hand saying, can we stop? No, my brain is full. <laughs> and I want to thank you, and I will make sure that you get the references. Maybe um, I can get them to uh, Peter to send out to you. Thank you again so much for your rich <laughs> wonderful.